independently and in advance of any relationships with others in which its owner might subsequently engage. Now, the deep-seated assumption that mind is an internal property of individuals that can be studied in isolation from their involvement with one another and with the wider environment continues to reverberate within the field of mainstream psychology. It has, however, been widely challenged, and ever more so. One of the first to issue such a challenge was the great pioneer of psychological anthropology, A. Irving Hallowell. In an extraordinarily prescient paper on, it was called The Self in Its Behavioural Environment, published back in 1954, Hallowell concluded that no physical barrier can come between mind and world. Any inner-outer dichotomy, he maintained, with the human skin as boundary is psychologically irrelevant. Fifteen years later, Gregory Bateson made exactly the same point. Mind, Bateson insisted, is not confined within individual bodies as against a world out there, but is imminent in the entire system of organism-environment relations within which all human beings, creatures of all kinds, are necessarily enmeshed. The mental world, as he famously put it, is not limited by the skin. Rather, it reaches out into the environment along multiple and ever-extending sensory pathways of the organism's involvement in its surroundings. Or as Andy Clark has observed still more recently, the mind has a way of leaking from the body, mingling shamelessly with the world around it. The earth, the sky, the very ground we walk, and everything on and in it are all part of what Clark would call the mind's wideware. They're not just what we think and know about, but underwrite and form an essential part of our very capacity to know. So thinking is not the operation of a brain in a body, but the movement of a living, breathing being as it goes along in the world. So I invoke the word social to get back to the question, what, what, what do we need a word, the word social for? I invoke the word social to signify this understanding of the essential interpenetration or commingling of mind and world. So far from serving to demarcate a particular domain of phenomena, as opposed, say, to the biological or the psychological, I take the word social to denote a certain ontology, an understanding of the constitution of the phenomenal world itself. As such, it's opposed to an ontology of the particulate that imagines a world of individual entities, each of which is linked through external contact that leaves its basic nature unaffected. Or in the terms of the <coughs> physicist David Bohm, the order of such an imagined world would be explicate. The order of the social world, by contrast, is implicate. That's to say, any particular phenomenon on which we might choose to focus our attention enfolds within its constitution the totality of relations of which, in their unfolding, it is the momentary outcome. So it enfolds and unfolds. And um, that's exactly, I suppose, what, how we should understand a brain, as, almost as a process of enfolding life into itself. And this brings me to the final misconception in Dunbar's social brain hypothesis. It treats the brain as a computational organ, a command and control centre set off from the body that, is alleg that allegedly responds to its commands. So the typical picture is, is um, here's the brain, here's the body, here's the world, world sends signals to the body, body sends signals to the brain, brain sends signals down to the body, body acts in the world. That's the, that's the standard, standard command and control picture. Um, and, and, and as you can recognize it immediately as a Cartesian construction um, in which you know, uh, it's simply been, been so to speak, neurologized. But the brain, of course, is not an organ. It is, if you like, an entanglement of neural tissue, which is analogous, if anything, 
to something like a patch of tropical forest or grassy vegetation, just stuff growing in a rather luxuriant way all over the place. Here's Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus. I just want to quote. Thought is not arborescent, and the brain is not a rooted or ramified matter. What are wrongly called dendrites don't assure the connection of neurons in a continuous fabric. The discontinuity between cells, the role of the axons, the functioning of the synapses, the existence of synaptic microfissures, the leap each message makes across these fissures, make the brain a multiplicity immersed in its plane of consistency or neuralgia, a whole uncertain probabilistic system. Many people have a tree growing in their heads. I'm not sure what he means by that. but he's, Many people have a tree growing in their heads. But the brain itself is much more a grass than a tree. And then he has a quote from Stephen Rose, who's here. Uh, the axon and the dendrite twist around each other like bindweed around brambles with synapses at each of the thorns. So let's then not ask what the brain does, but what is going on there. The brain is not an agent, but a hive of activity. Looks to me a bit more like a compost heap than a, <laughs> than a, than a sort of computer, or at least not a functioning computer. And the patterns of activity of neural act of tissue then are inseparable from those conducted throughout the body. And these patterns spill out in the world along lines of movement and growth. In some way you could say that a braining is a, is a knotting together of these lines. One way of drawing it and comparing it to this sort of picture would be to say, well, you've got you know, one line going like this and another one going like this and another one going like this. And none of these lines have actual ends, another one like that. And sort of in there is the brain. But it's not a, a rigidly demarcated box. It has no boundaries about it. Its lines trail off in all sorts of directions to the skin and beyond in endless uh, pathways. Perhaps another analogy might be just to take a fabric and imagine that you knot it up or scrumple it up somewhere and then all sorts of surfaces of the fabric come into contact that would not otherwise and transactions can take place across them. Perhaps the brain is something like that. But the crucial thing is that just as with the fa it's all one fabric. It's not as though the brain is another bit that is locked on to, to the body. It's all part of the same fabric. So the, the brain itself is part of the same fabric as the body, which is the same part of the same fabric as the world. And this actually makes a nonsense of the notion of group size. Just to go back to Dunbar and the social brain hypothesis, you remember he says, what is the maximum size of social groups that brains can handle? In order to produce a countable world, you have to cut it up into bits to atomize it and say, how many individuals do we have here? And the sort of folded fabric that gives us the brain is not, does not form part, I think, of a countable world. Well, the previous speaker uh, uh, quoted the words of um, Emily Dickinson, which I had not heard before and I was delighted by, and I'm going to read them again um, because I like it so much and because actually they um, almost coincide with a quotation that I was going to read. So I'll put them two, two side by side. I wrote this down very quickly. I hope I got it right. This is Emily Dickinson. The brain is wider than the sky for put them side by side, the one the other will include with ease and you beside. Here are the words of St. Augustine in his Confessions. Inside me, in the vast cloisters of my memory, are the sky, the earth and the sea, ready at my summons, together with everything I have perceived in them by my senses. And I want to, I think, by this, using the words of both Emily Dickinson and St. Augustine, to protest against the ways of theorizing the embodiment of knowledge. The proceed as though earth and sky, indeed the world itself, were extrinsic to what mindful bodies are. I want to protest against psychologistic approaches to what is sometimes called grounded cognition that effectively put the ground inside the brain Leaving, us, leaving individuals stranded in an unspecified environment which is invoked merely for the purposes of allowing the body to have something material to interact with. 
the increasing regard for neurological correlates of knowing, I think has been matched by an increasing disregard for the 